They just really bounce off each other. And a lot of Sam's friends. Sam, you're
you know, I gotta tell you, the important thing, it's very important when these guys come in here, everybody comes in here an hour early to warm up, to practice, and stuff like that. And all the people in the back, they're working with the sound for an hour early, and they do so much, so much. But their first responsibility is to plug in the coffee. <laughs> Yeah, you failed. <laughs> we like you anyway, but. Does that mean you're gonna fire coffee, me, Tom? The coffee will be ready between services. It'll be plenty. Anyway, uh, you know, this church has been here, we pretty much established ourselves as Hope Church, and I think it was 2001, we were trying to figure that out. It's either 2000 or 2001, we established ourselves as Hope Church. And, and since then, We've had a lot of people come and go at different ministries and stuff like that, and people that took over ministries and came and left, and some are still here, some are not here. Anyways, we came to the realization since 2001, we've never changed the door locks. And not everybody left happy. I think they all did, but not everybody did. Anyways, we've changed the door locks. So we have no problem with you having a key. You know, if you need a key, please take it. But Gina now is going to be Our Lady of the Keys. And so and we're actually going to actually keep records. This will be kind of unique. You know, we've probably given out 500 keys in the last 20, 15 years. And so if you need a key, please leave Gina a note or call the office, and we'll make sure that you get a key. That's not a problem. It's just uh, we're actually going to keep records. It's going to be kind of unique around here. Next week, this church, just like every other church, has a kayak and hiking ministry. Uh, okay, so some of them don't, but we do. And there's a kayaking event going to happen next Saturday. So if you're interested, get the information on the board and sign up if you'd like. And and uh, it's going to be really a lot of fun. And then the one last time I'm going to remind you, we do have the green bags out there in, in, the, in, in the foyer there. I like that word, foyer. I can't spell it. That's why I don't have it written down here. Um, the green bags are for, because we do not have a, uh, a food bank here, but we do support the food banks in Paradise. So please, if you can think of it, bring in a food, one kind of item every week, or something like that, put in those green bags, and we'll make sure that they get to the people that can use them. So, take a moment and say hello to somebody you don't know.
Hey, Hope Church, first service. Are you glad to be here today? Yeah. Good to see you all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you also if you're watching online and joining our worship celebration. Let's all give it up for the most dangerous worship band on the West Coast. Hope yeah. Yeah. It's been a great week. We had uh, our staff has uh, been working on. Uh, uh, our new next series, working on some small groups for the fall that we hope to add, and we'll be telling you more about that. Our band working hard and, and practicing for today. Uh, we had people like Art and Gloria showing up and just volunteering out in the yard and the landscape and, and others just coming and serving. I appreciate so much all the volunteers. We've got a volunteer revolution going on here at Hope. And then also, uh, uh, we had some people working real hard for the wedding that happened last night. Two people who came here about the same time but didn't know each other a few years ago. And I met with each of them individually and they uh, made commitments to Christ and I baptized them around the same time we all celebrated that. And they both got involved in ministry. It wasn't long I started noticing them sitting together all the time in the worship assembly. Hmm. And uh, last night, uh, Trevor and Megan was uh, married to the boss. It was really cool. So, uh, I thought it was really cool to see that happen. And uh, today we have a, a good sized group of Hope people out on the beach having fun. They've been sending me texts and I would say telling me lies about fish, but they've sent me some pretty cool pictures of some fish there. We have some people from Hope that are camping up at a lake having a blast. And we have some honeymooners out. Well, you know what they're doing, right? And, uh, so it's really cool that you're here. Thank you for coming. And uh, on your outline in the back of the bulletin, I have a quote there. It says, the inevitability of the death of Jesus does not stem from God's need, but from humanity. You want to stop there for a second think about that. The coming of Jesus to die on the cross didn't come about because God needed it. It came about because we need it. There are only two roles to play in the tale of divine and human relationships, persecutor or persecuted. God can cause suffering or God can suffer. God in Christ chose the latter. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Because of our need, God's reaction was not condemnation. God's reaction was to suffer for us. It's mind blowing. And in his book, The God-Shaped Brain, um, Dr. Jennings talks about a young girl named Savannah who was 15 years old and her parents brought her uh, for counseling. She's beautiful, normally very vibrant young lady with lots of friends and outgoing, but for three weeks she had stayed in her room. She hadn't eaten very much. She'd lost 10 pounds. Her parents couldn't figure out what was wrong, so they brought her to Dr. Jennings and left her there for some counseling. He could tell she wasn't happy to be there. And he said, what's going on that has caused your parents to bring you to me? And she, she said, why can't they just leave me alone? And he said, who? Your parents? And she said, everyone. And he said, your parents love you too much to do nothing when they see you hurting. And the tears start to flow. He says, would you prefer to have parents who don't care about you, who leave you alone in pain? And staring at her hand, Savannah says, um, it's, it's all I deserve. What's all you deserve? She says, I don't deserve parents who care. And he says, why do you think you don't deserve parents who love and care for you? What happened? And she says, I did it. And he says, what? And uh, she's got a look on her face like not wanting to say it. And he said it for her. You had sex? And she cried and nodded yes. And then she tells us a story that comes out that three weeks previously, two boys and her had gone for a ride in a car after school. And at first it was just fun listening to music, talking about school and friends. But then one of the boys began to make advances to her. And at first she tried to push him off and stop. He kept talking to her and, and uh, she was in fear. She didn't want rejection. Uh, she didn't want them to think bad of her, whatever it was, her prefrontal cortex, her reasoning of her brain gave way and she gave in. And now she's in guilt. Her body language is of shame, it's of guilt, it's of fear, fear of rejection, fear of never being loved, fear of ruining her life. And he says to her to help her tap into how she feels. How do you feel? And she says, horrible. I feel worthless. I'm no good. 
And he says, are you afraid you ruined your life? And she nodded, still looking down. And Jennings wonders, he says, about her view of God at that time, if she has the view of God that he's this angry, judgmental, condemning God, our God of love. And so he says, are you afraid you've sinned so bad that God can never love you again, that you're too dirty, that you're too awful, that you're too bad for God to forgive? Are you afraid that God is mad at you? And instantly, Savannah looks with a terrible fear and panic on her face, desperately pleading in her eyes, how could he? I had sex. I lost my virginity. How could anyone ever love me again? Fear was tormenting her soul. Rejection, ruin, condemnation, embarrassment, consuming her thoughts, stealing her joy. Before she could get well, that terrible fear had to subside. You can't, you can't heal when you're in terrible fear. But she believed lies about herself. She believed lies about God. And those lies obstruct the flow of healing love. Lies believed caused her prefrontal cortex, that reasoning part of her brain, to further inflame her limbic system rather than calm it. And I, I want to use these terms on purpose because I think if we really, it's really important that we understand this in our salvation, in having the assurance of our salvation. Now, everybody say prefrontal cortex. Very good class. That's the part of your brain that reasons, that makes judgments, that believes. You ever notice how much the Bible talks about believe, believe? We believe from that part of our brain. We believe certain things. And then we have met right next to it this thing called limbic system. Everybody say limbic system. You don't have it's not just in this book we're studying, it's you can Google it like I have, because I keep forgetting how to say all this stuff. And you can Google limbic system, and it talks about that part of the brain next to the PFC uh, that is um, the emotion. It's where we have a drive. It's where a sex drive comes from. It's where food drive comes from. When you see something, I want that. Uh, and, and, and if the prefrontal gets out of whack, we can be led by our emotions. And that's where we, we get off balance. And uh, this is what was going on in her because she was feeling so much guilt and so much shame, uh, she couldn't find that healing. And so he says this question, and I want you to hear it today, in case there's anybody here that's having a hard time right now through any kind of guilt or shame. It's so important uh, that we, we hear this. Are you tired of hurting? Are you tired of hurting? Are you tired of guilt? Are you tired of being miserable? Would you like to heal? Would you like to find peace and happiness? He asked that question to Savannah. She said yes. And her eyes had this look like, is it possible? Is it possible? Because it seems too good to be true. It seems too good to be true. And so he begins to go back like he does in this book a lot. And I've really enjoyed this going back to the beginning at the first fall of man when Adam and Eve sinned they disobeyed what God said to do in the previous chapter it says they were naked and without shame but when they sinned they was covered up and now they hide from God and it says in uh, Genesis 3 verse 8 then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he walked was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden but the Lord God called to the man where are you you know this is something I've never noticed I've always taught for a long time that God knew where Adam was he was wanting Adam to think about where he was and I still believe that where are you where are you but I've never thought about the fact that he's saying this tenderly he's not scolding he's not screaming at Adam look what you've done look what you've done he's gently pleading where are you and he's not trying to frighten him further and he answered I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid remember before the fall they were naked and without shame after the mistake the sin they're hiding just like Savannah was hiding in her room and didn't want to be around anyone and so God says this question 
He says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Think it through. Who told you? I've always made a big deal of, of some of the other part, but I'm learning here about the emphasis on the way God says, who told you that? Where did you, where did you hear that? It's not me who told you that you're condemned. It's not me that told you you are a shame. You, your own conscience convicted you and now is condemning you. Adam, my son, I'm not the one pointing out your nakedness. You didn't hear me say you were naked. It's your own conscience. You're feeling so bad because your brain is no longer in balance like I designed it. I love you. I'm here to save you. When Savannah heard that, her eyes grew wide with hope. Her mind is working. Can this be true? That's why it's so important to understand grace. It seems too good to be true. It is too good to be true, but it is true. And uh, she needed to learn this next point, and we all do, that Jesus does not condemn you. Jesus does not condemn you. John 8 is a great example to learn that. In John 8, beginning at verse 1, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. First of all, who are the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? High priest. High priest. You got a high priest. You got uh, you have a ruling council, a Sanhedrin, and they're part of that. There's different groups or sects. Pharisees were part of that. The, the, the teachers of the law, the scribes. But who were they if you, you grew up in that community? Rabbis. Rabbis. They're the experts, right? They're the people you look up to in your faith system that you grow up to respect, and they have the answers, and you're to do as you're told, and they're gathering around Jesus. It's Jesus's church fathers, if you will. It's Jesus's uh, people that he grew up around, that they were who they went to, to worship. That's why this is such a, it's got to be such a painful thing. Sometimes Jesus was so hard on them because of their hypocrisy, but he also wept. He wept for Jerusalem. And he's there teaching people good things. And here these guys come. Now they bring this woman. Think about the woman. They set her in front of everyone. She's there. She says that it's been, she's been caught in the act. So she's terribly embarrassed. She's alone. Last time I checked, adultery takes two. <laughs> Where's the guy at? She's all alone. She's embarrassed. Everyone's pointing their finger at her. Everybody's judging her, condemning her. Now, what is their motive? Why are they doing this? <coughs> to trap Jesus. So not, all, not only is she alone, in shame, caught, condemned. She's also being used as a tool. They're not concerned about just following the law. They want to trap Jesus. So they have impure motives in their heart. And so um, Jesus, it says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to stone, throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. It's interesting. Jesus doesn't say anything at first. Bends down, starts drawing on the ground. And they're still questioning. So you see these guys all around saying, you ever wonder, what is Jesus writing on the ground? Is it like a yearbook? Jesus was here. Have a cool <laughs> summer. See you next year. XOXO. Was he maybe writing sins? Gluttony, hatred, jealousy, rage. Uh, maybe 
writing sins and drawing arrows to certain people. <laughs> and then, this is so brilliant, and it shows the heart of God. He says, let he who is without stone cast the first stone. And look what happens. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, um, the older ones first. Only Jesus was left, with a woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I think it's interesting that the, the older walk away first. That shows the wisdom of age. And, and Jesus asked, If anyone hasn't sinned, not if they, they don't have stones, if anyone has not sinned, uh, let them walk away first. Is there anyone here who could have thrown a stone? So, you shouldn't be too hard on yourself. You're not the only one that has fallen short. And this woman was not the only one. And Jesus says this to her. He says, has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And look what Jesus says. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now, lead your life of sin. Go live a renewed life. Go be victorious over sin. Go live this new changed life. Not go in guilt. Not go in shame. Uh, all beaten up. Not go defined by the act that you did and labeled the rest of your life. Go. I don't condemn you, Jesus says. Neither do I condemn you. And some of us grew up thinking God's about con condemnation. And some Christians spend a lot of time in social network showing the world how much God condemns. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you. God doesn't condemn you. God's not mad at you. God loves you. Amen. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you. Condemnation sometimes comes from our own conscience. Our brains are out of whack and out of balance because we're believing lies. We're believing that we're done. We're too far gone. Or we're a victim. Our life is over. Um, the good side uh, there is a good side of our conscience when it bothers us and produces a guilt to bring us to God. It's good when you feel pain if you touch a stove that's hot, right? Why is it good? It's a way, right? Before there's worse damage. It's even better if, our, if we're so sensitive that we feel the heat before we get burned and there's no bad pain. That's even better. And if we do get pain, we go to a doctor to get help so the pain will go away, and that's healing. So there's a good side of a conscience that can have guilt when we realize something is wrong, we did something wrong, because we don't want to do that again, and we, we don't want more damage to us or damage to others in our life. And Dr. Jennings explaining that to Savannah says, how do you feel about now if that guy made an advance at you? And she kind of smiled and said, I would kick his butt. <laughs> and see, you learned you had some guilt and, and you, you saw the danger and you don't want to do that. It, so it's good, but you have to go to healing, not stay in guilt, not stay in shame, not even not, not feel condemnation. And that's a good, healthy conscience designed to help us stop what is doing anything that's damaging so it minimizes the damage. Pain after an injury motivates us to go to the doctor for treatment and healing. Guilt from sin was designed to get us to go to God for treatment and eternal healing. So you go to God for his treatment and his eternal healing. You're all beat up and you're hurting. Um, you got to understand that God is a good God. And that guilt's even good to the point where it leads us to God. It's evidence that our heart and mind is still sensitive to the working of the Holy Spirit. People who lose uh, uh, any, any kind of conscience are, are they, don't, they don't feel bad, get in all kinds of trouble and do all kinds of harm, and they hurt themselves and they hurt other people. Guilt only becomes bad if, like pain, it never goes away. Savannah wiped away her tears and thanked him. And she had a lot more work to do. The healing is an ongoing process, but she's now on the right track from hearing the truth and believing the truth about God, that God is about love, that God is not con condemning. Look at John 3, 17. 
God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to what? Save, save, the, world. save the world through him. God did not send his son to condemn the world. So how odd is it if we as believers think our job is to condemn the world? God came to save the world. God doesn't want any to perish, Peter wrote, but, but for all to come to the knowledge of truth. Are there people that reject him? Absolutely. It's heartbreaking. Um, but God didn't come to condemn the world. That doesn't change who God is because people choose to reject him. God is about love. There's a lot of people that just haven't seen the truth about God yet. They're still in darkness. I had an atheist say to me last night, he said, I'm an atheist, but I want you to know that is the best wedding I ever heard. I don't know if that was good or bad, you know, but I said, oh, really? And, and I go, well, you know, God is about love. And that's what we try to make a big deal is about love, God's love. And he goes, well, I, and he says it was, it was beautiful. And you know, you never know when people's eyes may open up when they hear the truth and see the truth that God is love. God is not a hater. God is not uh, uh, ready to, to, to nail everybody. He's reaching out with love and truth. Sadly, our darkened minds and fearful hearts sometimes have not understood it, and we live in guilt. And Christians uh, who say they believe in this God are into shunning people and, and, and condemning people. And it's so critical that we understand the truth about God because our minds cannot be healed. We cannot be healed our own relationship with God until we believe the truth about God. We are our own worst critics sometimes because we got the goods on ourselves, right? We know how bad we are. Maybe we've had a parent or a friend, a quote unquote, or a spouse or someone that kept telling us how bad we were verbally abusing us. You're stupid. You'll never amount to anything. Cutting us down all the time. And we start believing those lies. And then we project that with God too. We, we, he can't love me. I'm not lovable. I'm too far gone. And the truth of the gospel is he does forgive. And you need to have assurance of your salvation. Um, John wrote, these things I write to you who believe in, the, in the, the Son of God. Believe in Jesus that you may know you have, present tense, eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. In that period, scholars believed there was a group of, of uh, quote-unquote scholars who were called Gnostics. That's where the word knowledge comes from. And they claimed you have to have a special uh, knowledge to really be okay with God. You know, not just every, they were kind of these, like they were religious snobs. And so John, the apostle, loved saying, I'm writing this for you to know that all you got to do is to believe in Jesus. The Son of God. Believe in who He is, and you can know that you have eternal life. In another verse, He says, This is eternal life, that they may know Thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom, whom Thou hast sent. And it's so tragic that through history we've said, No, oh, this is eternal life. Go to church three times a week. Go to everything they have down at church and read your Bible a bazillion times every day and pray, 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 pray. All those things are good. But those things don't earn your way to salvation. You don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to get God to love you. And, and it doesn't matter what you've done. The only unforg unforgivable sin mentioned in the Bible is um, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And what I believe that means is rejecting the Holy Spirit. God can't forgive if we reject him. That's the only, it's not possible. He wants us to believe in our prefrontal Cortex. He wants us to believe that Jesus is Lord, that he's the son of God, that God is love, and we are redeemed, and we are restored, and we can go now like that woman and live a whole new life renewed. But what about when we sin? It says in 1 John that if we say we have no sins, we lie and deceive ourselves, deceive ourselves, and the truth, rain, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Amen. So it's like when you become a believer in your brain and in your heart, you lay your head down on your pillow at night and you go, God, I know I sinned today. I know there's sins. I probably don't know I sinned. But I'm so thankful I'm not saved by my performance. I'm so thankful for the cross. And I trust in what you did, Calvary. And you can go to sleep with a peace of mind knowing you are right with God based on what he did at the cross. Amen. You're not on this ledger. Okay, I sinned. Oh, no, I'm lost again. 
God, I just thought these bad thoughts. I know it's not wrong to get weird thoughts. I get them all the time. But if I keep going, let them go and let them go and dwell on them. God, I just said this bad word. Now I'm lost again. But I'm, I'm sorry, God. Now I'm saved again. God, I just got really mad at someone and lost control and lost again. I'm sorry, God. Now I'm saved again. That's not what it's about. It's living by faith. It's trusting in him. He already knows we screw up. So when John says he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of all of our sins, he's saying past, present, future. It's like you got this umbrella of grace over you. Amen. You are covered. You are covered. And you're in this Holy Spirit washing machine. But instead of water, it's the blood of Jesus that keeps washing away our sins. And we can live in assurance. Oh, people need to hear this so badly. I've had to for a long time. I had a hard time with this. And I didn't, I, I thought it sounded kind of whippy, you know, the gospel to say everybody's okay. And, and, and you're not saying sin is good. Obviously, sin hurts us. It hurts other people. It damages us. But Jesus didn't come because we could get our act together and be perfect. Yeah, we'll have victory over certain things. And we should keep striving, stay in the battle. But it's a battle of love. We're in a battle of love. We're in a battle of light in a dark world. You know, um, it was so cool. So many people were working so hard. Hope people... To put on this wedding and, and some other people from our community of course said not hope but they all worked so hard so much excitement and then Friday I, I ran around did a lot of stuff and then went to the rehearsal and uh, then after the rehearsal everything's set and I go home and I flop in my chair it's just a good feeling kick my shoes off and just relax and then I hear Vasa Vasa the Barbarian my little terrier first time I I knew I could fall in love with a little dog, a lap dog, you know, she stole my heart. And I hear her outside barking, but it's not her usual bark. She's got a bark that's just like, I just want to bark, rah, 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 you know, at night. Well, but then there's this other bark, like something's wrong. Something's wrong, I can tell it. I, I go, oh no. So I open the front door, right off I can hear really loud. It's a big one. I could see it coiled up. She has now, she's been bitten once and her head swelled up like a bat. I mean, it was huge. And we gave her Benadryl all night long. I was so worried and she came through it. Her tail started wagging in the morning. Well, since then, this has happened twice where she finds one and alarms me, but hasn't got close. I read online that some dogs just keep getting bit and you keep trying to Benadryl them and hopefully they live. Other dogs learn. And so far, she's pretty clever. The other thing I've noticed is this is the second time I go, Bossa, get in the house. And she runs and gets in the house. She never obeys me like that. <laughs> but since that snake bit, she does that twice now. So I go, I put my shoes on, and I have this annoying habit that drives my wife crazy. I don't put them on all the way. I'm stepping on the back of them, you know? So I got them on, and uh, I got tired of... Uh, of dancing with these things with a shovel or a hoe. So I got a little 22 pistol. So I go get this thing. It's the first time I've ever used it. I mean, I practiced, but and I, I, ton of, I, I didn't have it loaded. A ton of bolts in there. My, my uh, prefrontal cortex is trying to tell me and reason, get the gun, load the gun, be careful, take your time, you know. My limbic system is going, alarm, alarm, alarm. I wish I, wish I would have checked my Fitbit for my heartbeat, because I know it was worse than a spinning class. It was up there, you know. Boom, boom, boom. So then I'm walking in front of our house like Tom Turkington or Will Brook. You know? Now, this is how they do it. This is how they do it, you know. And I'm looking for that thing, because by the time I got back out, it's moved. Of course, it's around the side, so I have to walk around a corner, and there it is. Big sucker, big sucker. Boom, boom. My limbic says, you know, I'm, I'm hearing Indiana Jones. Snakes. Why does it have to be snakes? <laughs> Does anybody relate to that? And uh, so I'm like this. And I missed a couple times, you know, with a snake shot. I, I finally got it. finally got it. Uh, take the head off carefully. Put it. And then I'm going to take it out into the woods. Get rid of it. Uh, sit back in my chair. <laughs> Slowly. Prefrontal cortex. It's okay. It's okay. Alarm can go off. Turn the alarm off. You're safe. Dog is safe. You're safe. Send out cool pictures. <laughs> now, go to bed. Don't dream about snakes. Don't dream about the snakes. Rest. I go to sleep. Sure enough, sometime early in the morning, I see that snake. I don't realize I'm dreaming. I can see it real as life. The limbic system starts taking off. In my sleep, if you ever wake up, you're sweating and you're scared to death, that's what's going on. I finally wake up, prefrontal cortex, okay? 
snake is gone. The snake is dead. Use your reasoning, not your emotion, to lead you. And finally, I'm able to go back to sleep. Went through that about three times, but finally got some sleep. <laughs> I sinned. I've fallen short. I made a mistake. Yes, you have. But it doesn't define you. Use your brain, your mind, but to believe the truth. God is love. God is not out to get you. God made you. He knows how many hairs are on your head or not on our heads. <laughs> he knows our, our shortcomings. But he's so madly, wonderfully, crazy in love with us. He sent his son to bring us into this relationship. And we can live in peace and assurance. And we can find that uh, our God says, I do not condemn you. That our God says, who told you that? When someone lies to you about who you are and tries to define you, you need to hear God say, who told you that? I can tell you that. You need to hear Jesus say, I do not condemn you. I do not condemn you. You need to hear your Father in heaven say, come to me for your treatment of love and eternal healing. For I did not send the Son to condemn. Believe the truth today. Go out of here without guilt, without shame, without fear, and be free to love. That's why the gospel means good news. It's good news. Good news. It's too good to be true, but it's true. And we can go out and be free the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I, I know this in some ways is a simple lesson, and yet it's so hard for us to accept because it's not fair for us to be set free. We deserve uh, some kind of verdict because of our guilt but you know we can't keep the law perfect and you love us and you even knew at the fall you had a plan to send your son thank you for sending Jesus thank you that Jesus taught us more to know you what you're about and then he laid down his life for us on the cross help us to remember that's the cross and the resurrection that gives us hope not our behavioral modification it is you who give us hope and we can Believe that in our brains, and it will affect our hearts and our lives and our relationships. And we can be lovers. Even if others don't love us, we can keep on loving and be lovers because you are love. Help us to believe that and trust in that. We commit to that in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Let's stand and worship God. All right. <laughs>
teaching us about giving that it frees us that we're not here just to give that we're not taking anything with us and that we can give and, and our gifts to you can go to a great cause and, and we just pray for you to make us a, a force of hope here on the bridge and beyond and, and until uh, Jesus comes to get us and I pray you're in the middle of it God please help us we need you we don't want to do it without you anyway we want you to be glorified I pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building relationships to last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, every single day this week in Christ, we always have hope. Oh, thanks for being here, everybody. So before we start this song, I uh, had somebody come up to me and started rattling off names. And I said, so do you play a little guitar? And he said, no, I play a little ukulele. So I forced him to come up. Here we go. Thank you. 